understanding is uh, what's going on, what will happen is the key issue. The Secretary General, uh, in his remark uh, in the video, uh, started with, we are living an uh, uh, uncertain time. Uh, we are always living in uncertain time. Uh, the, the book, uh, The Age of Uncertainty, uh, from Friedman, came out uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but it's true, these are really uncertain times. And I will start with a quote from a Japanese writer, Murama, Murakami, uh, which is very short, but it's telling. One, the storm, this, the, the, the big storm we are living, uh, is over. You won't remember how you made it true. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in which the, 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 the quote had nothing to do with COVID. It was written a few years ago, but it, it, it gives us a clear picture that, uh, of, of course, life will continue. Uh, Europe will continue. NATO will continue. Uh, United Nations will continue. Uh, China and the United States will be around, but it won't be as before. It will be different. Uh, there is a war. I mean, this. I mean, I guess for you, this war, term "war" for coronavirus uh, sounds a little bit bizarre, uh, but it has been used in several times. It's a new mantra to describe this age of pandemic, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we know that there won't be a, a treaty of, at the end of the war, uh, telling us in a clear, clear way who are the winner, who are the loser. And uh, as General uh, Ristuccia uh, men mentioned before, uh, there are in drawing these scenarios different degrees uh, of uh, uh, probabilities uh, when we look at them. I am aware that you have, uh, uh, of most of you, have already seen uh, the short presentation uh, in which I try to describe these scenarios, in which I try to, to, to write down who can be the winner, who may be the loser. And let me just, uh, uh, for, for the sake of uh, rem reminding them, uh, mention the eight scenarios and then, as agreed uh, with the organizer, open up to a very interactive uh, dialogue with you. Uh, the first one already mentioned, by the way, by uh, General Miglietta, is that this is a global crisis, the most global crisis we have experienced forever, in the last centuries at least. The, the First and World War were not global wars. They were wars of the power at that time, but part of the war was not involved. Here we have the entire world uh, having at the same time a health problem, challenge, an economic challenge, which will become a social challenge and eventually may become a political challenge in some part of the world, all at the same time. And one certainty, let me start with scenario number one, is that if we don't deal to these challenges together, meaning among states, and together, meaning the health, the economic, the social and political. And if we continue to go uh, everyone on his way, my country first, if we continue to go, as the general mentioned, addressing one crisis at a time, uh, we won't go anywhere. So what happens in India, uh, which is far away, uh, it's not in our main uh, worry. I mean, we are worried by what happens in uh, Bergamo, in Lombardy, in Veneto. Uh, everyone in his from his country, in his country, look and think of his country. Uh, you are from different countries in the world. But uh, if the situation, uh, the health situation, is not solved in one country, it may affect the, the neighboring country in the near future. So why is China worried by North Korea? <laughs> North Korea is declaring there are no uh, cases 
in North Korea. Nobody believes that, of course. And the big China is worried by North Korea because North Korea is bordering. If a disaster happened in North Korea, everything that was done at Wuhan and in the previous lockdown will not be fine. And also in economic terms, <laughs> if we start to recover, to rebuild, and we have, for different reasons, at the same time, 10, 15, 20 default in other parts of the world because oil prices are down, uh, because there are complicated situations. I mean, you are very familiar with uh, conflict states and complicated states. Imagine uh, what happens when in a state uh, like uh, Iraq or Iran or Lebanon, on top of everything, you have a pandemic and the oil price go down and the commodity price go down. And so all this, point number one, together we win, uh, uh, united we win. Uh, uh, it's a clear message for you. You are a, a union. Uh, you represent a union, a coalition. But we need a coalition to address economically, socially, and politically what's going on. Second, one possible winner is the state, the comeback of the state. Uh, we all watch every day uh, in, all, in each country the briefing from the government telling us what to do, what we cannot do, and we follow the rules, and the state is everywhere, uh, pumping money into the health system, uh, trying to send money to business, to family, and telling us if we can travel uh, to one country, to the other, to one city, to the other, the state is back. Third, for someone, not only the state is back, but this is the big win of authoritarian states, China, Russia, and other, who can act uh, efficiently, no, limit, no media, no civil right, to impose whatever is needed to handle the crisis. I'm not so sure this, uh, if we look at the short run, maybe this is the case. Uh, if we look, uh, as we have to do, a more, uh, with a more medium long term uh, range, uh, I'm not so sure this is the case. The case. Clearly, we had, before, even before coronavirus, a sort of competition between democratic countries, weak, with all the limiti, li limits of democracy, which takes time to decide everything, to implement everything, and the big strength of authoritarian system. That was there before. We had it before. And during the crisis, it may look that that works better uh, in authoritarian state. But history teaches us that it is a war, or it, it is because of big crises that regime go down. It's not because of the opposition, internal opposition, which regime, regime do not allow. The third, a big question mark, which is very relevant for you. When we watch Russian soldiers in Bergamo delivering aid, when, and we applaud them because there was a need, when we see Chinese cargo delivering masks and ventilators, and when we hardly see uh, American cargos, American aid, and we have, on the contrary, news, confirmed news, that America is trying to get on our mask uh, on planes which are flying from China or from Vietnam to us, to any European country, and are diverted to go into the United States. Uh, does that mean we are changing alliances or we will change alliance? Does that mean that the public opinion in Europe, in Italy, will move from a pro-American uh, feeling towards a pro-Chinese or pro-Russian. This is particularly relevant for Italy, you know, because in Italy there is already, as there was already a strong pro-Russian uh, uh, sentiment. And also with China, there is a growing uh, pro-Chinese approach. What will that, while in the state, there is an increasingly high anti-Chinese sentiment. So what will this mean for alliances? And, and you are an alliance. Uh, point number five, uh, we will see that most likely uh, a big, big problems in emerging economies, which is uh, everywhere in the world, but the 20 countries which make, uh, belong to the G20. 
uh, oil prices are down, I mentioned, uh, commodity prices are down, people are locked down, and in most of this country, being locked down means you cannot, you have to stay home and you have no home. Uh, you, are, you live in a bidonville or in a slum. Uh, 20%, 30% of the population, think of India, think of Brazil, think of many Latin American countries. And being at home, which you don't have, means that you, can go, you cannot go on the street. And if you can't go on the street, you cannot work, meaning uh, do any informal jobs, which uh, uh, is very common in the Middle East, uh, in many countries, going to a street and sell everything and bring back a few uh, cents to feed your family. So we will have is an issue there, which, as I said, will become social and political. Uh, the sixth scenario uh, is that globalization, as we knew it in the last 20 years, was already facing problem, will face new problems. We are all discovering the need to produce within the country for yourself what is most needed. This is the opposite of globalization. We need Italian masks, Italian ventilators. We need to be able to produce car in Europe without relying from the, the value chain coming from Vietnam, Malaysia, or China. And this is a big uh, uh, strike to globalization. We'll bring to at least regionalization of trade, uh, Europe, Asia, North America, may also bring to a sort of compartilization of the economy if the American go on in trying to isolate China. And then uh, my last point, uh, I, I will leave number eight uh, for later. My last point is we, what will happen in the United States? What will be the future of Trump? I mean, I know you cannot make any political comment uh, as a, as a uh, uh, member of the army and of, of the uh, armed force, uh, but most of you may think that if the Trump era ends, uh, this would be a good news for NATO. I mean, Trump was not necessarily a big fan of NATO. Uh, uh, so what will happen to Trump? Uh, Trump uh, was uh, clearly uh, going to be the next president till three months ago to continue as president. Uh, the polls were showing that he had enormous successes to present to his voter. Wall Street, unemployment, uh, very low unemployment, uh, strong growth, all disappeared in three months. And during and while these success records were disappearing, the way he handled the crisis was at least uh, bizarre. Uh, denying coronavirus first, then saying if it could be a disaster, killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, then saying, no, it's not so serious, it's like a flu, and then saying it's trying uh, to oppose lockdown. And, and in the meantime, the number of people dying in the state was going up and is now number one in the world. And the number of unemployed people is uh, staggering. Uh, the, the situation is tough. Uh, and so his run towards the White House for the second term is not as certain as it was before. I took more time than I had promised. Uh, I would stop here. I was just trying to remind you the big pillars of my presentation uh, to, to make sure that you have uh, questions and doubts and comments to start a dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for a really insightful presentation introduction of the topics. So we can start with question time. So Stuart Major Girling. Yeah, thank you, John Luca. The first question is from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gordy. Uh, Mom, you're on screen. Good morning. Welcome. I, Good morning, Professor Magri. I'm my screen, In my screen, you are the only gender balance of the of the attendancy. There may be others, but you are the only one I can see. Good morning, Professor Magri. I'm uh, honored to deliver to you my question, and nice to meet you. 
As you have uh, pointed out, uh, taking care of our economy in the face of new challenges is clearly our highest priority. The rapid expansion of the epidemic in a few weeks has led to various blockages, from tourism restriction to the disruption of production to the drop in economic activity of all continents. How long could the emergency last and how much could the social and economic crisis worsen if, as you have highlighted, a lack of coordination of solidarity or of solidarity in Europe put at risk the deep political interconnection on which is, uh, its economy relies. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, this is the question. Because we, we know the situation is tough. Uh, we know that if this, uh, let's call it de facto lockdown, because we have the, the formal lockdown, which means uh, when the, uh, we are legally not allowed to do anything, but the de facto lockdown is, means that you may be able to do something, but uh, uh, it is so complicated to go back to work, to find raw materials, because your raw material comes from a country which is still locked down, or that you manage to find raw material and to go to work you are able to produce something, but there is no demand for it because there is no money around in the country you were used to sell or it's not easy to have transportation and communication in the transportation system. So the big question is, and what we know, we know that if uh, you have seen, I'm, I'm sure other talking about this in previous meeting, so our original uh, thought was, the situation is dramatic because we are going down in production and consumption, but let's hope that the curve would be like this. So we go down, then we have a short period of time of paralysis, and then we will be able to re-jump, to go up. Uh, nobody believes that anymore because we are clearly understanding that everywhere in the world, that it is easier to declare lockdown, it was not clear originally. At the very beginning, we looked at China imposing lockdown and we thought, how come? How is it possible to stop uh, all activities, to keep people at home? The first images of Wuhan were scaring for us and we thought it wouldn't be possible in Europe, in Italy, in our society, but we did. So declaring lockdown proved easier than what we are experiencing now in finishing lockdown. Look at all the debate all over the world, fight between mayor and governor and central government, uh, De Luca and uh, Fontana for the Italians. Uh, and uh, the, 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 so It's all over the world, it's the same. It's not only Italy, it's not the Italian mess which someone in a journal newspaper could describe. It's all over the world. So. At the end of the day, we know that the most likely scenario will be a U, which means you go down and you stay down for some time and then you go up in economic terms. But what we don't know now is how large will be this part of the, of the U. If, if, if it is one or two months, it's, one, it's good, worse than the V, but uh, not terrible. If it goes on for one year, that's a big issue. And some, the, the pessimistic, even think that we might face a W like Volkswagen, which means we go down, we go up, then we have a, the virus coming back and we go down again and we turn out. And the news yesterday from the WHO uh, that uh, this virus may even never disappear, like uh, HIV. So will be part of our life, it's clearly not a good news in us looking at the shape of, the, of, the, of this graphic. So your question is the big question. Nobody is able to answer you. What we know, uh, uh, what we know is that every month of lockdown at this point means a 2% decrease in global growth. So, we know that the International Monetary Fund made estimate 
uh, a month ago projecting a de decline in growth of minus world growth, minus 3%, minus 5% in the United States, minus 9% in Italy. But we know already that those figures are out, are over, and every month we pile up lockdown is minus 2%. Thank you very much, Professor. Have a nice day. Thank you. So the next question on the subject of the comeback of the state is coming from Major Liesel. Liesel, bear with me one moment. Leonardo, you're on screen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Professor. This is Major Liesel speaking, and thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to ask you uh, the following question regarding the, the scenario number two, second scenario. The come back to state could put uh, a strain on uh, European Union's delicate balance. But as you said at the beginning, uh, such global crisis uh, can be overcome if all states remain united. So in your opinion, what is the lesson the most important lesson that uh, European states will learn after this crisis, or what lesson they should learn, at least. Thank you, Professor. Good point. Um, anytime we discuss of uh, uh, the comeback of the state, or uh, we, we talk about uh, uh, nationalism, uh, it's an issue everywhere in the world, but it's a particular issue for Europe, meaning Europe uh, is uh, a, a coalition, a, a, a con not a confederation, it's a union of country, not, not a state, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, like a condominium state. And uh, if uh, in this grouping, everyone, start saying uh, my country first, which at the end of the day is uh, the point, uh, it, it doesn't work anymore. This again was around also before the coronavirus. We have to be, to, to be very clear on this. Uh, internal division in Europe are not new. They are part of the history of the, of the Union. And in the last few years, they were strong. Uh, the big, first big division was on what to do on Greece, you remember? Northern state against uh, the Med Club, which means, meant Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, somehow. Then we had a big division on migrants, East versus West. Uh, and then again on the European budget, uh, the frugal state of the North, the so-called frugal state of the North, and, the, and us. South. Uh, the coronavirus had added a new dimension at these divisions. Uh, the first one is again, I mean, it's, it's incredible, uh, coronavirus has affected more so far southern states than northern states. And again, creating this divide by north and south. Uh, Great Britain being uh, the, a little bit the exception, but Great Britain is out. So if we look at Europe, you see Germany not really affected, Holland and Netherlands not really affected, uh, and then you see Spain and Italy, Greece being the exception. So it, it, it goes on the same story. And what happened at the very beginning is what happened in 2008 and 9 with the previous crisis. We all state, all government did what they could. And we did the same this time. And we were saying, where is Europe? Why is Europe not helping? Uh, all states reacted, trying to do what they could. Uh, and what they can do, what they could do, was to, to, to get money, to put money into the economy, to put money into the hospital. But then realizing that money was not enough, that something more, something else was needed. Like in 2008, when the, the debt crisis erupted. First, each government was 
funding their banks, putting money into their banks, then with state money, then they realized that the debt of the state became uh, uh, too high and they had to go to Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, go to Europe and say, please, can we do something together? We cannot face it alone. And the same happened here. And the first reaction were, uh, sorry, Europe cannot help. But in the European crisis of 2008, this uh, reaction lasted four years before we got the final uh, uh, saving plan for Greece. Four years. In this case, four weeks. In four weeks, Europe moved from, uh, it's not my business, it is up to the state to deal with this, to the emergency plan, 540 billions of euro. Sure, the European Investment Bank uh, and uh, the, 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 the MS, the, the European Stability Fund, in four weeks. So, good news. So, it's not true that uh, Europe is failing, uh, at least on the emergency. But then we realize that the emergency plans uh, doesn't help, it's not enough. And we have to deal, it has to do with the health crisis, but we have an economic crisis, unprecedented. And so we start discussing on a reconstruction plan, recovery plan. And on that we need trillions, not billions. And on that, uh, the agreement has not been reached, but we know there will be one. So where is the discussion now? Is between the frugal states of the north, the so-called, and us, uh, the, 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 the med club uh, most affected, which is now in a different group because France belongs to this group clearly and others are supporting this. We are discussing two issues. How large? One, two or three trillion. And how? Loans or grants? Because if, it, if take Italy, if this money will come as loans, that means that our debt will increase. We are now already at 175% in two months' time. We could easily go to 200, 220, and that will be, after the pandemic, unbearable for our country. It means that Mark, no one in the world would buy bonds of Italy if the debt is 250 and we have a growth which is minus five. Un un untenable, impossible. So, what at the end of the day is the comment? Uh, Europe is there. Europe dis did not disappear. Europe did more than in any previous crisis. We have a big step to watch. It, we will know something in the next uh, three or four weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor, the next question is coming from one of our friends and colleagues in NRDC Spain. Ignacio, I'll put you on screen now. You're on screen. Good morning, Professor. Good morning to everybody. Thank you for your, uh, in my view, excellent presentation of these seven uh, fields or uh, scenarios you mentioned, waiting for the A. Um, and the, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this in this uh, series of, of DTCs to the NRDC Italy. Uh, my question is related to the uh, areas where the COVID-19 is affecting uh, particularly, and we mentioned many times health, social, economic, and political areas. Um, but in my professional a uh, feel I'm very interested in the defense. How the defense is going to be or is uh, affected uh, right now? And in particular, the post-COVID uh, scenario or under the permanent COVID situation, if it's uh, to stay with us forever. So uh, there are two uh, after my, my readings and exploration of these things, there are two uh, postures. One is to change dramatically to a private sector and a national sector. 
sidelining somehow the international intervention due to the, uh, the lack of uh, uh, interaction international organizations has shown during this phase phase, uh, first phase. And the other aspect is that the, the, uh, the defense, the, the other group, it, the defense will focus on a different space, uh, meaning uh, focus on other areas rather than the uh, physical defense, which will be given to international organizations. National defense, international organizations, one posture, uh, summarizing, and the other posture is private sector and national sector sliding, sidelining the international organization intervention. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a defense expert, but uh, I will uh, uh, share, nevertheless, a few comments uh, on your question. The first question is uh, the balance between national uh, activities and uh, uh, multilateral activities. You being uh, uh, a, 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 an example of multilateral activity. I mean, again, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the crisis of multilateralism was there before. Uh, it's not a consequence of uh, coronavirus. Uh, the symbol of the attack to multilateralism uh, came first from the United States, one of the founders of the multilateral system. And, uh, and by the way, was also directed to your institution. Then he, back, he said, no, yes, but it's clear that the current uh, American president uh, does not believe in multilateral solution, uh, which is understandable in a sense. I mean, if you are a superpower, you don't, you are not uh, very happy to be uh, bind by multilateral rules. Uh, you may, I'm sure you remember, maybe some of you was involved uh, in the, the second Iraqi war uh, when Bush son uh, wanted to convince also with fake uh, uh, proof uh, the Security Council to have a coalition, large coalition, um, is uh, at a point he said, either you come or we will go alone, which is <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's the, a clear signal that a superpower, uh, when a superpower wants something, cannot look after to the decision of uh, uh, Slovenia, Denmark, Italy, and, and many others, it's San Marino. So that's, and th th this was clear much before coronavirus. It was clear on trade, on the WTO, on the United Nations. Look at the United Nations. Do you recall any uh, role, real role, not just appointing a special envoy, of the UN in solving a crisis. If you look at uh, Ukraine, Venezuela, uh, 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 Iraq, Iran, uh, uh, and Syria, and Libya. I mean, um, the, the UN does not have any, an incredible track record in finding a solution to crisis. It has a more relevant uh, role in keeping peace after a solution has been found either by the winner or by an agreement, but we don't see much of the UN right now. Uh, on, the, on your second question, uh, uh, on defense, specifically on defense, uh, it, it's, uh, it's clearly a challenge for NATO again. I mean, NATO has been uh, trying to recover in the last 30 years to the so-called end of the previous enemy, which was the you know, Soviet Union, and managed in all the strategic revision, strategic plan to reinvent itself. But now 
then come, uh, Trump came and put again a, a question mark on the necessity of the alliance. But now you have another issue. There is another issue. Uh, there is a war, a world war, but the enemy is a virus. <laughs> so it's not uh, a country. Uh, okay, Trump is trying to make a coincidence to, 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 to overlap uh, the, the virus and the country, uh, China. Uh, but it doesn't look that to this stage of knowledge, uh, many countries are buying it. Many share concern on what China did or not did at the beginning, but there is no strong support to the idea that uh, China has built, created in the one laboratories, a virus to attack first itself, because the first victim was China, and then other country to change global equilibrium. So the, the, the issue is in this continuous transformation that you have been facing, you as all army in the world, uh, armed force in the world, of having a, a clear enemy and that not having a clear, clear enemy, but then having the, the same clear enemy because from that enemy you still have cyber attacks, you still have territorial interference like in Ukraine, and, but then you have China on the other side coming up and then you have terrorism, which is a, another invisible threat. And now you have another invisible threat, but is coming from a totally different field, uh, from the health sector and not from uh, uh, a non-state actor, which was the previous challenge with terrorism. So it's, uh, let me conclude saying it will, it's going to be an interesting time also for you, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, uh, as, I, as I started with, uh, with a quote from the Japanese author, uh, we will survive the storm, but all will be different from what we were when we entered. And that, I, I think, will a little bit apply also to you. So the next question is going to come from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chenet, who's uh, a French representative in our headquarters. Bear with me one moment. Okay, you should be on screen, Sir Professor, I would like to ask you two questions regarding your point, the victory of authoritarian state. First, the use of the term war by some political leaders to name a medical crisis has been seen by some observers as a rhetorical expression, allowing by then these political leaders to take strong measures, closing the door to a free and democratic debate in the parliaments of their countries. Do you agree with this statement? And do you see that as an authoritarian threat? My second point is regarding the place of China tomorrow. The citizens of European countries are questioning the globalization we have lived in these past decades. Do you see that European Union will support the attempt of independence of European countries regarding strategic medical goods and the tentative to build a stronger more balanced and better industrialized European market in order to reduce the influence of China. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, question one. Uh, the use everywhere of the term war. Uh, it's an interesting question because when it was first used, it was in China two months ago, when Xi Jinping declared the people, the Chinese people were to the virus. And when I first read that, I thought, hey, voila, this is the uh, party propaganda mobilize, trying to mobilize people to get uh, into uh, this uh, and to hide problems. Uh, in China, not to uh, utilize uh, extraordinary power because the state has already extraordinary power in, in not being a full democracy. But so when I first heard that, I thought, uh, oh, this is an excuse. As you said, this is a way to... Uh, then everybody started to, to use the, war, the term war. And... Uh, I was reflecting on that. And to be honest, I think that given the gravity of the situation, I'm sure 
each government in democracy, democratic state in Europe, for example, would have used the same extraordinary power to address the issue, even without using the term war, even without declaring a war. Uh, because the situation is tough, anyhow. Then, on the contrary, you have, in some countries of the world, but which were already illiberal, already half democracy, where the fight to the pandemic, sometimes denied the pandemic, has been used to impose curfew. Uh, in some African countries, uh, clearly that happened. I mean, there is, it's, it's strange because the, the, these, the, these African countries are, in a sense, saying on one side that there are no many deaths for coronavirus because there is no control, no testing, no health system. But at the same time, to prevent coronavirus, they are imposing curfew. They are in preventing anybody to, to go on street. But this is clear. I mean, I mean, it's true also in countries like Lebanon, Iraq. They were on the verge, they were experiencing huge mass protests before coronavirus. And stopping people and preventing people to go in the street was also a political move. But uh, so I don't think, to make it a long story short, that in our democratic countries, uh, the, using the term war was, was an excuse to introduce extraordinary power. And on the contrary, I've seen that a war climate with some cohesion has erupted among the population, as was built up. I mean, if you look at the fl Italian flags, I mean, uh, which are everywhere. In, I, I'm always moved when I, uh, as, as a former officer, I have uh, an extraordinary respect for, for the, the, the Italian flag. Uh, and I, I, when I walk around in, in, in I, su I do walk around uh, uh, sometimes because I, I, I'm, as a journalist, I can't go to, off to the office and make video like this or, or to have interviews. Uh, when, when I see in Milano so many flags, I'm moved, and, and this was not imposed by the government, is that people feel we are at war. Uh, I know General Battisti is, uh, is uh, attending because he wrote me something about Alpini. Uh, General Battisti was, as I was, at the Alpini uh, annual gathering uh, uh, a, a few months ago, and I was happy and sad. Sad because when there are uh, Alpini national uh, annual gathering, uh, in, in, dif in different cities in Italy, all houses have an Italian flag uh, uh, on the terrace, on the balcony. In Milano, which is a colder city on this, there were very few, just the one put together by the, the, city, the, the, by the mayor, by the, the city hall. Uh, with this war, which was not imposed, there was not, uh, there are so many, which tells a lot. Look at the way people are reacting everywhere in, the, in, the, in liberal countries to the role of doctors and the nurse, uh, applauding them. This is a war climate, uh, getting together. Uh, okay, going back to question number one, uh, the, the next step, what is important is that we, this getting together climate in, at a time in which we cannot get together, by the way, uh, moves also at the European level and the world level. We are, fighting the same war. We have to be together and try to help each other. Uh, it's not just because we have to be good, uh, because we believe in God. It is because we have to be very selfish. If we don't, if our neighbor in our building or our neighbor in our region or our neighbor in Europe, Switzerland and Italy, don't solve the problem, we will not solve the problem. Industry, so the second question. Uh, will this uh, bring uh, to a, a more structured uh, uh, European uh, industry? And uh, again, uh, I'm sure the issue in your mind is defense industry, which is still far from being integrated and does not have the critical mass to compete with other blocks. 
Uh, I think yes, a little bit, meaning that that was in my point uh, uh, two, uh, when or, or the one on globalization, we are realizing that we cannot rely on other regions of the world on strategic industries. And to do that, we have to build up European champions, which were already a debate floating around, which means, and we, we were a little bit resisting in some countries because we know and we knew that building European champions will mean having German and French uh, big company uh, uh, be the, the leader because they have champions, uh, okay? Uh, uh, and they are running the show. They are running the show. But so we're keeping this in mind that building European champions may not be good for countries uh, like Italy or Spain or Denmark or other, uh, I think we will see more of a European champion also in defense uh, in the future. I'm not sure, that's my last point, there will be much money for defense in the next, increased money for defense in the next couple of years. I'm not sure, because already you had this climate green agenda, uh, which has been announced as a priority in Europe. Now we have uh, a competing agenda, which is uh, uh, health and survival of European citizens. I, I, I'm afraid there will be more, a lot of short, short-term approach in the near future in trying to keep everybody alive and uh, healthy and uh, with something to eat and not big picture, uh, I'm afraid. So the, the next question on the subject of uh, new alliances will come from Major Gonella. Andrea, one moment. You should be on screen now. Good morning, Professor. This is uh, Major Andrea Gonella. Thanks for your lecture and for the opportunity to ask these questions. Uh, my question is about the fourth scenario, new possible alliances. Uh, in particular, how long will it take to the Russian bear to start fearing to be eaten by the Chinese dragon? Are there any possible drivers of instability that can put the two uh, Eurasian land-based powers one against the other? They share thousands of kilometers of borders and a whole region that is rich both in resources and intentions. Not to say of possible shifting small countries, satellites to Russia in the past, but maybe to China in the future. Is uh, it so impossible to think about uh, a real impossible alliance change as a scenario in which Russia reverts back to NATO as Russian national security interests start to crash? with the Chinese ones, which could be effective Western strategies to drive a wedge between these two authoritarian countries. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. The, this is the, the European issue of the future. Uh, we have been, uh, we have grown up after the end of the Soviet Union, we European, believing that we could be free riders in the world. Good, fairly good relationship with Russia, good business relation with China, alliance with the Americans. So, in the middle. And uh, this was no more true even before coronavirus because China has changed because Russia has changed because America has changed. So all at the same time, Trump's America is not Obama America, is not the America we have known before. Putting number five, four, five uh, is the one who uh, threat, uh, European uh, rules of the game, uh, invading uh, uh, Crimea. Putin number five is the one who entered again after 30 years, the Middle East game, changing completely 
the pitcher, and then Erdogan joined as well. And then and Xi Jinping, uh, with these new plans, with the Silk Road, uh, and with China piling up growth records, and uh, China piling up money to buy influence, as all superpower do, uh, uh, and coming at odd with the United States. Uh, so we, at a point, realized that we were not joyful free riders among uh, the three powers, but we were uh, in the middle of a fight, uh, in the middle of uh, the fight between uh, China and US on one way, on a tariff, on eventually on who will run the world, the American century followed maybe by the Asian century, which is the China century. So this was clear even before coronavirus. We knew that. Uh, coronavirus with one country is accelerating that. And this is China. We are now uh, with all this rhetoric on, two, on the two sides, on the uh, Chinese virus and the one laboratories and chi ask China, Trump saying, ask China why we are dying in the state. Uh, this is uh, moving towards not a war, but clearly something similar to a cold war. Uh, and in, in a cold war, uh, we, we were not allowed to do much with the Soviet Union. Of course, we Italian had some degree of freedom uh, the German as well. We, Fiat could build a, a car factory during the Soviet Union time. We were all buying oil. We had some interdependence, but not more than that. And we may get, we may get to something similar. And uh, we will be in the middle with Americans saying, if you buy your way, I don't buy your products. And Chinese saying, if you don't, follow me on the Silk Road or whatever, I will, not, I will not invest in your country, I will not buy your public debt, I will not uh, uh, sell you, buy your products. And the, the issue is complicated in, in, in Europe by the fact that the trade relationship, it's hard to, to be close to this America. It's difficult. Uh, as it is difficult to be close to this China. But uh, if we look at the balance of, of power in terms of interest, uh, our economic interest is more in US. Uh, our trade, European trade with US is 10 times the one we had with China. So it is clear where, where we should look, but at the same time, uh, we know, we all know that the future will be Asia. So if we look at the long run, it's hard for everybody, for politician, for business leader, to make a drastic choice between, should we be asked, between them. Russia is a totally different history, uh, picture. Russia is not an economic power. Uh, Russia has a very clever leader, leadership, we, who, man, who all the time managed to get into crisis and take position, enter and take position in the Middle East, in the oil market, in, and of course Russia is scared to hell to see China rise. And clear, there is a, a, a political commentator, a Russian political commentator, uh, once was asked uh, how he, he was seeing the new, you remember after Crimea, China, uh, sorry, Russia turned to China to sell gas to them, saying, okay, you European, you don't like me that much, I will sell gas to China. I don't care, I will go in that direction. And this, this commentator, Russian commentator, was asked, how do you see China and the uh, Russian relationship? And he, he replied saying, ah, you know, it's like the relation between a big snake, a boa, and a mouse, a small rat. Uh, usually, if you put them in the same box, uh, the big snake eat the, 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 the rat, the, the, the mice. And he said, I leave it to you to understand who is the snake and who is the mice. 
uh, mice between Russia and China. And this was a Russian communicator, okay? It's clearly that. So, uh, but Putin and the Russian establishment is clever in uh, doing what I, I say this in Italian, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, when we have the, 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 uh, the, the previous first republic, we had Christian Democrats, uh, one po political uh, strategy was politica dei due formi, being in the middle between two uh, 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 opposition party, you would go to someone sometime, to the other one sometime, to make sure that you are always in power. So, so and, and Russia is doing a little bit that, cleverly so, cleverly so. Look at the Middle East. I'm sure you are very familiar with the Middle East. Russia is at the same time the best friend of uh, Saudi Arabia, of Israel, of uh, Iran, uh, a little bit less of uh, uh, Turkey and then with Egypt and then in Libya and all these countries are at war with, with the other but Russia is in in the middle in the middle cleverly so thank you professor thank you so the next question on the the fall of emerging economies will come from Lieutenant Colonel Ponti Franco, on the screen. Yeah, good morning, Professor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Franco Ponti. Can you hear me? I have a very short and straight question for you. Uh, talking about uh, emerging economies, in, uh, in your opinion, which country among the so-called emerging could be able to recover better than other? Europe. I, I, could, could you repeat? No, I, I lost the question. Yeah, no. so uh, talking about uh, emerging economies, in your, can, in your opinion, which country amongst the, the so-called emerging could be able to recover better than others? This okay. is the question. Thank you. Uh, are you the one uh, 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 training a, a workout? I saw a movie advertising how to work out in lockdown. No, it's not me. It's not me. Ah. Maybe he, needs, he like needs to do workout, but he's not one. <laughs> he needs to do workout. <laughs> no, that, I do. I do workout. If that comes from one of the general, it's, it's not a good news. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, no. Um, uh, which emerging economy will uh, uh, come out first? Uh, most likely, Asian countries. Uh, most, can, most likely Asian countries, because they, they, uh, they, they entered uh, the crisis with a good economic performance, not like Italy. I mean, we, we tend to forget that we will go minus, we will go worse than the other, most likely, but we were already worse than the others. I mean, there is an, as in many cases that I mentioned, there is an acceleration, but the, the basic trend was uh, there. So Italy was zero minus zero or plus 0 0.1 and we go to minus nine. Other countries were plus three and they will go to minus five. So the difference is always nine, but in our case, it's uh, all minus. To, to continue on this reasoning, I mean, in Asian countries, uh, in some Asian countries, take Vietnam, uh, take uh, uh, Singapore, uh, take uh, uh, other uh, countries which are moving up, which are in a sense replacing China as the factory of the world. China will not be the factory of the world in the near future. The, 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 the Silk Road project is uh, a way from the Chinese leadership to show that they are aware that in the future they will not be able to produce at low cost because pe Chinese people want to be paid more and they want to consume more, okay? So the, the Silk Road is a way to connect China with many other countries where China and other can go and produce at lower cost. Laos, for example, and other, Mongolia and others. So uh, this country will come out uh, quicker, uh, most likely, and the International Monetary Fund 
already is projecting that. Uh, when they say minus nine for Italy, they say minus uh, two or one or even plus uh, for some of this country in the near future. And these countries are also better equipped in, uh, uh, in keeping uh, uh, measure to reduce contagious for a long time. They had experience SARS. And I mean, I'm sure you have been traveling for your uh, activities and you have seen five, six, three years ago uh, in airport, Asian people wearing a mask. And, and that was because of SARS in 2003. But many countries after that kept that tradition. They are accepting more than us uh, 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 all this technical uh, equipment to monitor uh, movement and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, social distancing. Uh, so most likely they will be first uh, to come out. Uh, it will be a big issue on the contrary for some African countries. Because uh, we don't know, as I said, how much the pandemic will affect the health system we know that they don't have an health system. That's the point. And uh, uh, we, we know that the state, when we, I mentioned the comeback of the state, uh, there is an implication of that. You need to have a state. Uh, in some country, the fragility of the state is so strong uh, that when the state is needed, there is no state around, which by the way, to, my, to our Italian friends attending, it's a vulnerability of, of our country as well. So when the recovery will have to start, also in the emergency, when not only hospital will be in the front line, but public administration, uh, people allow, giving permits uh, and to build, uh, to restart, when the uh, subsidy will have to reach family quickly, Casa Integrazione, well, bank to have to give a loan quickly, this is when you see a weak state not performing, a weak apparatus not performing, and you see strong apparatus being able to quickly mobilize. Now we have seen people showing solidarity. We have not seen in Italy people protesting. We don't see much of a, 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 a deviation from rules. It's we, more, less than we expected, but it comes a point in which people, if they are promised to receive money from the government and they don't see it in their account, will fight. If entrepreneurs, business people are promised to receive loan from the state and the bank are slow and are not giving it, that will be an issue. And this is when you, we will see good, strong and agile state apparatus and state apparatus which are not. This is my, as Italian, my big concern for my beloved country. And this, is, <laughs> this will be the big issue for African countries where the state is not existing. Thank you so much, uh, Professor.